Hey, hello everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. I think uh, we've we've given enough time for people to uh, to join who are a little bit a uh, bit late. So I think it's uh, probably a good opportunity to get this party started. Uh, I am Tom King, and I am the founding director of the Fundacion Borincana, uh, and I'm also lead instructor for the Puerto Rico Energy Capital Access Program. On behalf of our cohort members, our mentors and instructors, and the program team, I am delighted and excited to welcome all of you to Presentation Day, the culmination of our acceleration program. We have completely sold out. We're at our limit. Uh, we may have to go back and think about our, our Zoom account to, uh, to increase it. So thank you very much. Please keep yourselves on mute and please do submit comments and questions in the chat. Uh, for us and our members, uh, particularly through the process as questions arise from the presentations. We will have a short period of time at the end of each of the presentations to relay those questions to the speakers and ask them to uh, comment and uh, direct their responses to your queries. Bueno, uh, soy Tomás King. Uh, en nombre de los miembros de nuestra cohorte, uh, nuestros mentores e instructores y el equipo de programa me complace darles la bienvenida a todos al día de la presentación, la culminación de nuestro programa de aceleración. Nos hemos vendido completamente. El webinar se llevará a cabo en inglés, pero puede publicar cualquier pregunta en el chat en español si lo desea. Uh, PreCap is uh, in large part funded in 2020 thanks to a grant from the Rural Business Development uh, and uh, Rural Utility Services of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, we want to recognize them and their support uh, in these difficult times as we run through this and uh, make sure that, that people understand uh, the importance of the work that they do. Uh, and we're like the council and thank you for, for being part of that. Uh, we also uh, would note are looking to extend and expand this program into 2021 and beyond. Uh, and have uh, made an application through the CDBG for uh, continued funding. So we look forward to continuing this program for uh, many years to come. So the Fundacion Borincana is a nonprofit that was formed two years ago in order to uh, enable and accelerate the energy transformation of Puerto Rico for the benefit of its people. Without addressing the insecurity of energy infrastructure, we cannot succeed in the redevelopment of Puerto Rico, correct economic injustice, and raise a million and a half American citizens out of poverty. I'm going to switch my uh, my screen off uh, so that you know I'm not a distraction in the bottom, uh, and we can just look at the presentation. So give me a second here. There we go. So for, for those who are visiting or maybe uh, haven't lived through it, uh, Puerto Rico uh, is an island of incredible promise with favorable markers uh, for political, regulatory, legal, tax, uh, and demand support for uh, resilient and clean energy solutions. Uh, they have an energy policy that favors 100% renewable and sustainable energy by 2050 and many nearer term targets, um, likely to be missed, but they have very, very ambitious uh, program, uh, especially given that we are now at 4%. So there's a long way to go. We have 3.4 million people who are already sold on solar and storage and local distributed generation. That's a, a market that you can't find uh, anywhere else in the United States. Uh, it's important to note that the obstacles that you see in other markets from entrenched incumbents and uh, regulators, uh, politicians, utilities uh, act as a, a break on transformation. Uh, those things don't really exist in Puerto Rico. They're all aligned and supporting transformation, uh, financing and progress. And I think the last thing to understand from a, an investment standpoint is that uh, Puerto Rico is uh, part of the broader United States and benefits from U.S. laws, courts, and currency. Uh, three things that, uh, that other markets don't share. 
In the next incarnation of clean and sustainable technologies are currently being developed in, in Puerto Rico, you know, including business practices, financial innovation, uh, dynamic regulatory structure, and political determination. These are all being tested and refined in Puerto Rico. What we see and what we have happens and what is learned in Puerto Rico is going to end up being applied and the transformation of core infrastructure around the world. Transformation is underway, right? The modern, resilient, distributed, and just energy infrastructure uh, is coming to Puerto Rico, but enormous challenges do still remain. Uh, Puerto Rico lacks the institutional, commercial, and individual capacities and experience to effectively and expeditiously complete their transformation. This is the world in which the Fundacion lives. So our operational structure and our focus is unique, we believe. Uh, with our network and expertise, we address those things vital to energy development and transformation that are mostly overlooked or avoided by the government, nonprofits, and the private sector. We build capacities and improve institutions, accumulate capital and aggregate demand, develop markets, and we educate. But we additionally craft and execute tangible solutions that are scalable, replicable, and sustainable. In addition to PreCap, which we're obviously celebrating today, we actively support and act in matters of energy policy and regulation. Uh, we recently launched a talk radio show and podcast in Spanish called Buenos Dias con Energia, uh, hosted by our very own Valentina Garramuño. Uh, and you can actually uh, access episodes from our website and Facebook. And I think um, we should be seeing that posted in the, in the chat. Uh, so you can, uh, you'll have the access to that at your fingertips. Uh, we are also planning to launch a solar market development and workforce IT training program uh, under the title Grupo Analítica Solar Independiente, um, Así Hacemos Solar. And next year, we will be renewing our initiative to establish a PACE program in Puerto Rico. So transformation requires funding. Um, as with many in the nonprofit sector, uh, the earthquakes and coronavirus pandemic have greatly affected operations and our ability to pursue fundraising in 2020. We are actually only now beginning to build our donor base, uh, open up sponsorship relationships, and align ourselves with large grant-making organizations. The Puerto Rico Energy Transformation Drive 2021 is our first principal annual fundraising campaign and supports our direct action initiatives that foster sustainable and resilient energy infrastructure in the Puerto Rican archipelago. We have a target for 2021 to raise $200,000. We hope, I hope, that you will actually consider the impact and value of our work and what we bring to Puerto Rico and support us with a financial contribution. Uh, we're putting links uh, in, the, in the chat to enable people to do that. Um, think about this as a, an impulse buy, if you will. Uh, but uh, you uh, learned long ago, you don't ask, you don't get. So we're trying to make this, uh, this easy for everyone here and, and elsewhere. But we're going to be uh, maintaining this campaign uh, from now and through the, the early part of the year. As I like to say, don't give till it hurts, just until you feel good about it. We also want your non-financial support. Uh, please, if you are inclined, like us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, join our Transformation Drive team and our WhatsApp chat to get early information on activities and help us amplify our messaging. Uh, these links, I think, are also appearing in, in chat as we're, we're talking, so they're, they're right at your fingertips. And I assume that there's going to be questions and things, so we'll post these back into chat again a little bit later. So for people who join later uh, or for those who uh, just want uh, easy access, you'll find the ability a little bit later. So let me give a brief overview of the program before we move into today's main event. I want to first recognize and thank 
a world-class team of instructors and mentors. Uh, and I, you know, I, I can name them and shame them, uh, but I think uh, I'll just uh, mention that these people have decades and decades of experience that they're bringing to bear uh, for the benefit of, of Puerto Rico uh, and the program. Um, for this second cohort, we actually added two, which I'll, I'll just call out, um, Malo Velasquez, uh, who was a director at uh, Roosevelt Roads and obviously the former executive director of Rey Imagina Puerto Rico, um, an incredible talent who's dedicated uh, a good portion of her, her working life to uh, benefit uh, the people of Puerto Rico. I also want to call out uh, C.P. Smith. Um, C.P., uh, many of you may know from his efforts on the, the island through the Cooperativa Intellectual de la Montaña and uh, through the, the program Rey Enfoco was one of the members of the first cohort. Uh, C.P. has tremendous uh, empathy and skills uh, of process and, and program management that we were glad to welcome to help us uh, work with our, our second cohort members. Uh, I also wanna thank our guest lecturers and panelists. Uh, we brought in and, and held panels on uh, you know, contractors and developers and uh, uh, finance and a number of other things through the program. Uh, and these aren't regular instructors. And I also wanna throw out a particular mention and thanks to uh, Dino Barajas of uh, DLA Piper, who's uh, given generously of his time in both the uh, first and second cohort. Uh, and of course, I want to make sure to thank uh, our team, uh, David Gieter, uh, Valentina Garramuño, and Gonzalo Barreto. So while we're at it, um, I want to recognize and thank our hearty alumni from cohort one. Uh, COVID extracted a significant price in terms of attrition uh, in both cohorts. So we recognize and appreciate the determination of our members. Their success is our success and the success of Puerto Rico. And just to, to give you a little synopsis of, uh, of these groups, the Reenfoco project of the Cooperativa uh, consisted in the installation of uh, rooftop solar voltaic systems uh, in the communities of Ayuntas, Hayuya, and Utuado, and uh, is planned to generate about five megawatts of power and uh, they're starting with uh, 250 uh, locations. And eventually, this should be around 1,250 locations uh, to some of the worst hit communities and residences uh, that were affected by, by Hurricane Maria. The ICC microgrid project is actually a, a very unique uh, project. Um, and takes the, the, the trend to the next level with generation and integration of a standalone distribution system uh, to ensure resilience and scalability uh, while offering complete independence from the government utility. Um, sponsor is uh, uh, a chemical corporation uh, in uh, Tayeboa, uh, in the barrio of Peñuelos, and they've been there for over 45 years. And they've partnered with uh, DexGrid, which the words aren't there, but their symbol is on the screen, uh, which is a, a novel uh, group that is using uh, the distributed ledger uh, in order to provide a governance and management and payment systems and control for uh, microgrids and uh, prosumer uh, developments uh, on the island and elsewhere. It's a, it's a homegrown group. It started in Puerto Rico. It's representative of Puerto Rico uh, and it's going to grow and uh, be a feather in the cap of Puerto Rico. So the program itself, uh, I don't wanna go into every detail. If you want, really want details, we would love to talk to you in detail about the program. Uh, but I think the easiest thing to do is we can make available a, uh, a survey webinar that we, we've done uh, prior to, to each of the, the two cohorts as an, as an orientation and introduction to the program and, and the benefits. Uh, I think we're putting a link in the chat if people want to see that. 
but look, we'd be delighted to, to talk to anybody and have a separate call. Um, just, just let us know if you want to put a note in the chat, we can pick it up there or you can contact any of us. We'd be delighted to talk at, at more length about the program, about extending it into next year and beyond, whether you know, you're looking to, to partner, uh, be a, uh, a sponsor, uh, or if you're looking to bring your project into a future cohort, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, as a quick breakdown in short, you know, naturally, we're providing the expertise and training required to uh, bring projects from uh, a state of uh, chaos, let's say, uh, with you know, generally very, very talented uh, groups and individuals, but uh, need technical assistance and financial education in order to you know, get to where they, they need to be. Uh, knowledge transfer, uh, we build capacity, we build skills, and more importantly, we build confidence. Our members leave with the tools and experience they need to engage with key stakeholders on a professional level. And I think you're, you're going to see some of that today. Now, in addition to the training, there's a the certain, uh, well, I, maybe a stretch to call it a philosophy, but there are certain principles when we think about uh, development and growth uh, that we try and instill through the way that we approach development and, and uh, problem solving and, and uh, interaction and other things with our, our program members. Uh, basically, you know, the first one is simple, seek advice, get help. Uh, you know, if you don't know something, don't try and, and brave it out. You know, we're around to help. There are others, you know, seek out, you know, help rather than trying to do it on your own. Uh, maybe even understand the value of that, uh, of that help uh, and be ready to pay for it if necessary. Uh, that's not easy for everyone to do, uh, we note, but it, it's an important uh, mindset to get into. Um, understanding needs versus wants. Understand, your product, understand yourself. Uh, I think it's a, it's a strange but basic maxim. And uh, I've seen plenty of conditions where people design projects for their wants. Uh, and at the end of the day, they really sacrifice their needs. Um, we also want to people to question their assumptions and look for alternative solutions and especially unexpected risks. And that has to be built into the way that, that you approach and think. Then of course, we want people to know that they are the experts on their projects and that what constitutes a risk, you're in the best position to know. But you also need to anticipate and satisfy the gatekeepers of capital. So you have to know them as well. You have to understand their requirements and their motivations. And when you can satisfy those and exceed their expectations, you will do very well. And then the, uh, the, the last uh, slide, I, I, won't, I won't cover the first two or the last two points, but I, I just want to stop on the middle two. Creating visible roadmaps for accessing capital that are replicable, scalable, and sustainable is critical to expanding and accelerating development activity in energy from utility scale all the way to community projects. And unfortunately, in Puerto Rico, there are precious few examples to go by. Also, capital providers' perceptions of Puerto Rico are generally not favorable. Uh, what we want is for them to see a different Puerto Rico, one where borrowers and projects can be well-organized, professional, and qualified to access their capital. So let me uh, move, I guess, now to the, the presentation stage. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, an introduction, I think, on, on each of these, um, rather than do it before each one. And then we can, we can run, I think, from one end to the other, uh, just to uh, be uh, a little bit more fluid here. Uh, the, the first up, and I think I've got these across the screen from left to right, in the order in which they, they will go. Uh, first up is Sori Salina Fere Resiliency Centers. Um, they're looking to, and will, uh, create resilient green infrastructure as a key component in the development of disadvantaged communities in Puerto Rico. Uh, they are strengthening their internal capabilities and capacity to offer services without interruptions, um, contributing to you know, increased resiliency and serving the communities and the children and the education and the service centers uh, in which they, they operate. Uh, they have uh, 25 centers uh, around the island and the uh, Puente Jobos 
uh, in Guayama is the subject of this particular um, session of the uh, cohort. So this is basically their model and the, the, uh, that we work with. And they'll be talking about this and more things. The second up is uh, the footprint project or Alquila Solar. Uh, very, very interesting uh, footprint has uh, operations around uh, Umacao and has distributed mobile uh, solar and storage uh, facilities to disasters in Puerto Rico and other uh, locations around the US. And their goal is to assemble uh, 100 or more solar trailers in Puerto Rico uh, by Puerto Ricans for disaster power outage response. And they hope to build uh, sustainable recurring revenue streams for mobile solar by contracting seasonal off takers um, for hurricane response, for string construction, and for staged and parked small business resilience. So you'll hear from them today. Uh, the third up is Radio Grito. Uh, and I want to thank Radio Grito. We, we worked with Radio Grito to develop the Buenos Dias con Energia um, radio show. So thanks again. Uh, their proyecto uh, is uh, around their radio station and, and completing the, the conversion of this into a full community resiliency center uh, in Laris. And uh, they'll, they'll talk about their, the energy system and the storage that they want to add, um, you know, what it means to the community uh, and also you know, how they are working with uh, FEMA and USDA and the municipality of Laris to make this happen. And then the, uh, the, the final, but by no means least presentation uh, is our group that is decidedly uh, not solar. Uh, this is Green Gas Puerto Rico, and uh, they're looking to uh, develop a project and a bioeconomy in Puerto Rico uh, to solve the massive waste problem and to offset the fact that Puerto Rico uh, imports 100% of its, of its gas energy requirements, and uh, they will be in a position to produce renewable natural gas for resiliency and uh, the market in, in Puerto Rico. So I think with, uh, with that, and I'll, I'll give her a couple of, uh, of seconds here to, to switch over, uh, but I will, uh, I will stop my screen share and uh, we can move to uh, Maria Lacombe, uh, who will be presenting the uh, project from Sori Solina. Okay. Um, Make sure that she can share her screen. I don't I, I, the before. host oh, disabled the participant screen sharing. Yeah, should have done this before we started, Maria. Maria, welcome. How are you today? Good. How are you? <laughs> okay, now I have access. So let's get Whoops. started. Whoop. Yes. <laughs> Maria, I, I can't hear you, Maria. Do you have your microphone off? Nope. No. Tom, the rest Tom, of us. Tom, we can hear her. You can hear me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> huh, I still can't hear you. Hmm. We, we can hear her. Oh, you can hear her? I just can't hear her. Yes. Uh, okay. That's my fault then. Sorry, I can fix this. I can make this happen. <laughs> Maria, you might as well go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, then I'll, I'll get started, Tom, and then you can join us along the way. Yes? Sorry, my apologies. I turned off my, uh, my speaker so it wouldn't clash with another source, so. <laughs> I'll just get started. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can see, my name is Maria, I'm Maria Julieta Leconte. I am Grants Manager for the Centro Soy Solina Ferre, and I have the pleasure of presenting for you today the Resiliency Community Project for the Centro Soy Solina Ferre. Now, um, before we get started with the project, I, I thought it was appropriate to give a little bit of context. So um, Centro Sorisolina Ferre is a nonprofit that has been operating on the island for the past 51 years. Um, it started as a small service center in La Playa in Ponce and since has expanded to serve 25 municipalities, 21 uh, public housing development projects, 
Um, and it includes schools, it includes services for, for elderly care and after school programs. Um, so this, this organization has been working at community development for many, many, many years. Um, and I guess one of the things that has shifted in the past three years has been sort of this new awakening, this new awareness of the importance and the urgency to have resilient communities. It's no longer enough to just simply serve them, but now we actually have to prepare them so that they can withstand any disaster situation. Now, uh, we wanted to start with Hobos in Guayama. It's the community that we selected. And for those of you that don't know Hobos, this is an amazing picture that you have in the background. It was taken by David uh, Jeter, David Jeter and um, Gonzalo Barreto from the Precap team. And as you can see, it's this beautiful lush community that's located right next to the sea. Uh, and it is, it is a very pleasant place to be if you're not in a disaster situation. So it's, there we go. So um, we're a nonprofit. So why are we engaging in, in the topics of renewable energy and, and solar power? It really doesn't make a lot of sense. But in reality, what happened, I think, to most organizations after 2017 is that we gained, again, we went through, through something very uh, stressful. We underwent a transformation. And now we acknowledge that even if we're not ready for the next time it happens, we will have to engage in emergency response and emergency recovery services. Um, the Centro Solisolina Ferre throughout the Hurricane Maria learned many lessons. We were able to build homes, deliver food, deliver water, deliver help. And it was something that we did reacting to the situation. But remember, Remember, we were preparing for normal hurricane season. So we were expecting maybe two weeks without power, maybe two weeks without water. And for us, that has become, you know, our way of life, it's manageable. But Hurricane Maria was different because it extended. It extended for six months, seven months. We ended up having uh, communities that spent a whole year without power. And when you think about it, Imagine yourself as a single parent living in Hobos. You probably have to take care of one or two children. You have no power. And in Hobos, that specifically meant also having no access to water. You have to figure out food. You have to figure out storing medicine. If you have maternal milk, that's a whole other set of issues. Elderly care, cleaning your sheets by hand because there was no washing machines. It becomes an overwhelming situation. And to have communities endure through that time and time again, first with Maria in Holst, then next with the earthquakes and now with the COVID, it creates a set of, of really unlivable situations. And so we wanna be able to mitigate that and be part of that solution. So one of the things that we did with the Precap team, and I do have to recognize the help of amazing mentors like Valentina Garamuño and Malu Blasquez who helped us with the community resiliency uh, areas. And then Jose Monjor and uh, Jose Torres Monjor and Gabriel Perez, who helped us with the energy, cost efficiency, making sure that the investment is made, being made where it needs to be made. And so we drafted a resiliency strategy. Now, don't think of it as just hobos, think of it as a model for resiliency. And when you think about all of the facilities that the Centro Sorisolina Ferre has, it means a big scalability for that potential resiliency. So one of the things that we have is that we engaged the uh, National Emergency Management of Puerto Rico in uh, an alliance to have micro and macro pots. Basically, it means that when supplies come to the island, they directly go to these macro and micro pots that distribute to smaller nonprofits and then to residents. This means that the supplies won't get lost. It means that the supplies will be delivered to the people who need them. And we all understand how crucial that is when the airports are closed, when the ports are closed, when there's no first responders coming in for two or three weeks. We understand the emergency, the urgency attached to that. The other thing that we did is that we sought out FEMA funds to have these community safe rooms. You saw that in Hobos, they're right next to the beach. So whenever a hurricane season comes, there's this dangerous uh, potential of having the waves come in uh, during the event. And then this additional uh, component of having faster recovery, having community empowerment and having resiliency so that we can continue to provide services and to support the community. And all of this is a model for all of our sites starting with Puente Hobos in Guayama. Now currently the site supports a school, 
Um, it supports prevention and social aid for 650 residents, and the majority are elderly residents. Services for public housing residents, and then the macro body. Now we want to add to that disaster response, community preparedness, and resiliency, resilient facilities. And one of the things that we're looking for along this journey is to engage partners, partners who understand the, the situation, who see the vision of having all of these different community assets created throughout the island so that next time we are better prepared and next time is as soon as in six or seven months. Um, having said that, we have explored installation options. Option number one is on top of the school, which is what you're seeing there. Um, and that provides uh, an option. Uh, the second one is to rescue a space in uh, the back of the school. So the hey, best Maria, Maria, sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Tom. Um, your, your slides aren't advancing. We're all still looking at the, uh, the first picture on the first slide. On the first slide? Yes. On the first, first slide. <laughs> first, first your, your slide, title yes. slide. Your title slide. Ah, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? It happens. Well, you were um, flowing. I felt bad about interrupting. You, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I am seeing on my end the slides advancing, um, and you're not. Are you we're seeing not. it now? I, um, the... I think you, you need to start sharing again. What about now? Uh, it says you started sharing, but it hasn't loaded yet. Why? Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's still trying to, to load. Oh, okay. Now I see the Resiliency Community Project Wayama. And okay, here, I changed to another network. Is that better? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I see the Resiliency Community Project. Um, what does it say? Hobos Koyama. Sorry, your, your, your picture is in front of part of the screen. So. Okay, can you yeah, guys it's, see it's the moving, Resiliency it's Strategy? Moving, it's moving yeah, back and forth. We're on Resiliency Strategy. We're seeing Resiliency Strategy. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm telling you, I have this really intimate relationship with Murphy. <laughs> he crashes all my presentations. <laughs> well, I, I, um, lucky so, I had the camera up. My cat made another visit just now. So, <laughs> well, I apologize. I will um, just resume. So, one of the things that I mentioned talking about the resiliency strategy was this slide. Um, I will uh, move on though because I want to be conscious of the time. So, one of the things that I was discussing was that the site at Hobos has two alternatives for getting the solar system installed. One is to do it on top of the school, which is option one. And then two, which you should be seeing on screen, is the basketball court on the back. Now, as you can see, it's an open space right now. We wanna build a roof over it and then install the panels on top of it. Um, we did demand analysis and we did energy uh, assessments and we would need a system for 43,336 kilowatt hours plus storage. So it would take it to about 46,000 kilowatt hours. Um, we would definitely need storage and battery. Um, and one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna provide open spaces for the community, public spaces for the community to meet and gather and organize. Having a roof over that basketball court would enable that. Um, so it's many, many benefits. We did a project layout. Now the site in Hobos is big. It has a lot of potential. Um, in blue are all the existing uses, and then in gray are the resiliency additions that we would have to make. Now, um, I should mention that we have an agreement with Liberty so that we can get antennas and Wi-Fi installed in the area to have better communication potential. But the other thing that we want to do is we want to leverage what we already have. We have an industrial kitchen to prepare fresh food for people. We have a lot of space, so we can have... Uh, laundry stations, uh, bathroom stalls, refrigeration, um, and hydroponics. And remember, six or seven months without having refrigeration, without having to three weeks without having access outside of your community, you need to have food supplies that are readily available, fresh food supplies. Um, and then on 
number two in the back is where the panels are uh, would be located with the basketball court. Now, we did uh, do a financial analysis on the project. We understand that right now, as it stands, it would take us a partner or several partners to get funding for $142,000. We did divide it up into smaller packages, understanding that um, it, it takes it takes a village. <laughs> so we need first to get that secure rooftop panel uh, for the panel installation. So that would be around forty five thousand uh, dollars. Then the solar system, the system bundle, and then the equipment to do the community engagement. We have already started conversation with some amazing nonprofits in Puerto Rico, Para la Naturaleza, Mercy Corps, and these are organizations that have so much, so much technical knowledge. So that's the other thing. We want funding, but we also need technical partners, people who have the same vision, but who also have the technical know-how to support us with implementing this model in Hobos and then in other sites. Now, um, I will mention that the Centro Sorisolina Ferret does have past experience with solar power. We have four uh, PPAs for uh, purchase power agreements throughout the island. Um, so we have had experience managing or having solar systems in, in our facilities, but this project is different. We want this project to be owned by the centers so that we can share that ownership. We can transfer the knowledge of maintaining those systems and so that we can have that, that shared ownership with the community. So it's not just a Centro Sorisolina Ferre, it's a Puente de Hobos community project. Um, and it definitely includes integrating them into the design, the planning, and the maintaining of the whole um, concept of the project. We did project economics. It's important to note that we had help uh, estimating the cost and analyzing this thoroughly because as a nonprofit, we cannot afford to be spending money where it's not needed. Um, and the analysis shows that what we spend right now, what we spend in operational budget for energy is about the same as we would need to install the system, except we would be adding resiliency. We would be adding capabilities to the community. And above all, we would be creating a clean source of energy. Um, and in the benefits analysis, we do have to keep the big picture in mind. We are, we would be essentially taking out of, of the contamination chain, 30 metric tons of carbon dioxide. That's equivalent of removing six cars every year off the roads. And, and we do have to acknowledge that part of what happened to us and what's gonna keep happening with Hurricane Maria is that climate change is happening and we have to put a brain in to sort of mitigate it. Now, the other centers that we have selected for emergency management are also in high uh, in this journey of uh, sort of trying to understand how uh, we engage in community resiliency, we have to finish the pickup program first. We already sent out RFPs um, to get a better idea of who our partners might be and to also get a better grip on the cost of the project but we've also engaged with peers, other organizations that have gone this journey, that have already crossed to the other side and who can help us and are willing to help us shorten that learning curve. And this has been very enlightening and also very enriching because we are essentially sort of being part of a network of resilient community centers. Now, uh, the other things that we need to finish now are finding funding and technical partners, installation of the system, the community engagement for the equipment, and then for the operations and the management. I will say, um, and I know that I, I took a little bit more time because of the slight mishap, but we need to understand the Centro Sorisolina Ferre is an organization that takes a dollar and turns it into $46 worth of services. It's an organization that has the capability of supporting communities through education, prevention and social assistance, through economic self-sufficiency, and even through entrepreneurship. And this resiliency component is not something that comes out of the blue. Uh, the centers model themselves after the life of Sori Solina, and she was a visionary ahead of her time. She understood way back 51 years ago 
that community development, that poverty is not addressed simply by addressing one issue, but it has to be an integrated multidisciplinary approach that's dynamic. And right now that means is that aside from removing barriers to education, to self-sufficiency, to wellness, to entrepreneurship, we have to engage in disaster recovery and making sure that when communities are hit by disaster, they don't lose it all. And then if they do, they still have assets within the community to rebuild faster and better. And that's what we hope to do. Um, so I did want to share that my team, and that is me without makeup, but my team <laughs> from the Centro Sorisolina Ferre worked for the past few months to develop this resiliency strategy. And it would not have been possible without their help. We have facility managers, Jose Vera and Carlos Cintron, Eva Vasquez, controller Elizabeth Morales, agent, fiscal agent Giselle Duran, and our compliance officer, Wilfredo Torres. Um, and I do have to thank the mentors, Jose Torres Monjol, Gabriel Perez, Valentina Garramuño, Malu Blasquez, and the entire pre-cap team, Gonzalo, David, and Tom, because they all very patiently supported this journey, along with other mentors like Victor Rojas and Jose Humberto Roman and C.P. Smith. So that's it for my presentation today. I, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if this presentation doesn't inspire you, use the QR code to donate with the note holes resiliency. <laughs> I will stay online in case there's room for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm looking in the in the chat. Um, I don't see questions. I'm going to uh, ask people to, to put questions in there. Uh, I think uh, I want to mention that, and I didn't mention it before, uh, all of our uh, cohort members are going to hold, um, sorry, it, it helps if I don't turn on off the sound while I'm trying to turn off the video. Um, it, uh, private sessions, so smaller group sessions next week. So, uh, you know, if you don't have questions now or you think you'll have them later, you want to learn a little bit more about uh, what is going on in uh, their project or their organization. You want to offer help, uh, you want to offer advice, um, I'm sure they'd be welcome. But the link uh, for to register for the, uh, the Zoom meeting with uh, Maria and her team to, to talk about uh, their project is in the chat now. Uh, so, you know, feel free. We're also going to take this, we're going to do this, one of these for uh, everyone. And uh, we'll also put it in a letter out to all registered uh, attendees. So if you don't get a chance to take it out of the chat, we will uh, send them all to you later. So you'll have plenty of opportunity without having to scramble for them. Um, I wanna thank Maria in particular. Uh, she did a tremendous job, especially after uh, my mess at the beginning and the mess with the slides. So your model of composure. Um, Maybe we do have time for, for one question. I, I don't see anything in there, but you know, maybe this is just, just one, I think. How do you feel and how do you think you, your team feels now um, having you know, come to this point with still some work to do, but when you came to us, you, you had um, very, very grand ambitions, which I think are still there in terms of you know, transforming your entire communities around all of your, um, your, all of your installations, all of your community centers. Um, you feel that uh, you've got a shot at doing that and have an idea how you might approach it? I, I think so. I mean, one of the things that I, I do deeply thank the, the PRECAP program for is that we gained um, a better understanding and we were able to develop a strategic approach to how we want to do resiliency. At the beginning, we had ambitions of building utility level solar power, and that's all in all great but it's not exactly what we need to be focusing on because of the, the vision of the organization and the urgency of the communities we serve. And I think by learning the technicalities of it, we've gained a new language um, to develop the strategies necessary, but we also have um, sort of a new approach and a new vision so that we know exactly how to build something that's aligned to what we wanna achieve long-term. That's terrific. And thank you very much. Obviously, if anybody has any additional questions they think of along the line for, for Maria, you can put them in the chat. Uh, I think it's set up so that you can actually private message people. I don't think we've restricted that. Actually, I'm not sure our, our level of Zoom allows us to restrict that. Uh, so uh, if you want to privately message Maria, I'm sure you can, you can find her on there and ask questions that way. Thanks very much. 
So our, uh, our next group up is uh, Alquila Solar from the Footprint Project. Um, this is a little bit different and a lot of fun. And, and Will is, uh, is reaching us from the West Coast. Uh, well, I won't, I won't tell your story. I'll, I'll let you share your screen and, uh, and get going. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me okay, Tom? I can hear you. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm backlit. So I'm going to actually leave my screen off. Whoopsie. Um, can you guys see this? Uh, header though the beginning. We can. I can see okay, your full awesome. screen. Great. I'll take uh, myself right. and put myself on mute and turn my <laughs> camera off, and we'll just. And Maria, look at you. thank you for being the 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 starting gauge there. That was. Um, I feel very fortunate. Um, so just to get started, my name is Will Hegard. I am the operations director uh, for Footprint Project, and we are just so excited to uh, share what we've been working on through PreCap and um, we'll just wanna express our sincere thanks to Fundacion Borincana and all of our um, cohort members and advisors. Um, congratulations to the, the other fellow cohort members. I think we've all come a long way <laughs> in this uh, project. So uh, we founded Footprint Project after Hurricane Maria to solve a very simple but intractable problem, which is that disaster teams just struggle to deliver clean energy after uh, climate disasters, which are increasing in severity and frequency and scale. So we wanted to address the challenges disaster response teams face by powering their emergency operations needs, lighting, communications, water, sanitation, and refrigeration by deploying mobile solar and batteries to provide that power instead of uh, diesel generators or gas generators. So overall, our mission is to help build back greener after disasters uh, by providing cleaner energy to communities in crisis. We recognize, you know, mobile solar battery systems aren't completely climate neutral, but our goal is to move the needle towards more renewable sources and break that negative feedback loop uh, of responding to climate disasters with fossil fuels. Um, since we started in 2018, we've deployed uh, over 45 kilowatts of mobile solar, uh, 170 kilowatt hours of mobile batteries to over 10 disasters across the domestic U.S. and Puerto Rico, serving, we estimate, over 14,000 U.S. citizens. Um, so we've been busy, unfortunately, with uh, <laughs> even more busy in 2020. Um, but really, uh, what we want to get into today uh, for the, our final presentation for FreeCap is um, our goal, which is for this program, to, we really focused on how to assemble a fleet of mobile solar battery power systems in Puerto Rico uh, for shared community use. So uh, this drone footage is from a recent build we just completed in partnership with two of our core partners, uh, Empowered by Light and Sail Relief Team. This is a, a heavy duty sun-based solar trailer, one of the largest we ever built with two solar shelters that can be stored inside the trailer then set up on scene to provide additional charging and, and shade. Um, but what we've noticed is that we're We've been building these in the ones to twos at a time, you know, one at a time based on small grants, equipment donations, and individual fund um, fundraising drives. And our goal for PreCap was how to develop a, a financial model for um, scaling the assembly and delivery of these systems for uh, for disaster resilience needs. So to support our system, uh, our mission, we uh, have started to rent them. So through PreCap, we've, we've kind of standardized our social enterprise model uh, to scale these, these, uh, the delivery of these units. We've trialed a, a few rentals in the uh, lower 48 states with a handful of mobile solar trailers, which we've rented out to the temporary event and construction industries uh, to help fund our disaster deployments. But we've yet to expand this um, either regionally into Puerto Rico or um, expand it in terms of the number of uh, mobile solar trailers that we are able to deploy at one time. So uh, our goal, you know, it may not be a hundred, but our goal is to expand a fleet so, so we can really assemble, manage, and maintain 
uh, mobile solar equipment to ultimately make a dent in the fo fossil fuel use during disaster response and, and recovery. So our goal here today is to identify a network of what we call core partners who can help us build the on-island fleet of mobile solar infrastructure for, for Puerto Rico. Um, so over the past year, we've been working to standardize these mobile uh, solar trailer units. We've landed on three sizes of what we call the sun base. Um, based on field needs, these sizes range from kind of what we consider first in or light duty systems that can power emergency lighting, communications, equipment, and device charging, kind of like your, your uh, small scale power needs up to uh, medium and heavy duty sun-based units that have enough solar generation capacity and battery storage inside the trailer to actually back up a uh, um, permanent infrastructure, whether that's a fire station or a small clinic. You know, these are not, I want to preface, are going to power a, a hospital, but they, we actually just recently, we trialed our first building backup for emergency, an emergency shelter in Cloverdale, California, with a medium duty unit which plugged into uh, a shelter for you know, permanent infrastructure uh, via manual, manual transfer switch during uh, the wildfires and PG&E outages uh, in Cal California. So we really are trying to uh, create the, the um, different units that can meet either deployed power needs or, and also serve as critical infrastructure backup when they're not deployed to the field. Uh, we really, through precap, really focused on what kind of the value add of putting solar panels and batteries on wheels versus other resilient en en energy options, uh, particularly for or and through the lens of disaster responders. Uh, right now, the current kind of resilient energy options out there are either bringing in a fossil fuel generator during an outage, or you know when you're when we're looking at large scale humanitarian emergencies, your options are, yeah, diesel or gas generators and then managing that fuel supply chain or trying to install a stationary off-grid solar battery system on permanent infrastructure, which may be compromised and in a, in a relatively short period of time when there's a lot of rapidly changing um, um, field environments and just field needs. It, it can be tricky to, to set up permanent solar or stationary solar and batteries. Um, we do recognize that you know the, the upfront cost of a solar trailer is going to be uh, higher than a stationary solar battery system um, and does incur a larger cap upfront capital investment. Uh, we but the long term stationary versus mobile costs kind of even out the um, and and only two of these uh, kind of energy options are deployable or rentable in the sense that, you know, it's hard to move a stationary solar battery system around. Um, finally, there, you know, there's a unique benefit to mobile solar in terms of green job creation. And we also think that there's a unique educational uh, aspect to allowing or delivering more, you know, solar renewable energy systems to communities that are um, in need. We also just want to highlight that, you know, after talking to a number of our partners in Puerto Rico, uh, particularly after Mar Hurricane Maria, you know, there might be, a, a, you know, fossil fuel generators might be cheaper up front, but if they break every month when they're being used 24 seven, it can become a massive security problem while also um, kind of losing an investment if you're if we're um, burning cash on on fuel. So in this regard, we think that mobile solar provides a unique level of flexibility to rapidly deploy renewable microgrid assets where they're needed most without relying on costly insecure fuel supply chains or um, having to make that down um, upfront investment in permanent solar um, storage when during an outage where you know the, the infrastructure needs might change, the response and recovery needs might change. So that's kind of where we kind of landed on, on these, the solar trailer um, system. And then of course, I, we just want to share a, a unique and a little anecdote from our response during the, the earthquakes this past year. 
it's we notice that there's just most people don't gather around a <laughs> gas or diesel generator and so when we rolled in you know rolling solar battery systems into communities that would otherwise be in the dark carry unique qualitative benefits that can't completely be quantified by by just upfront or, or long-term capital costs um, but through precap we've really landed on or tried to hone in our the challenge of what we've of the last two years that we've noticed in scaling mobile solar for community resilience and it really comes down to aligning equipment financing for other you know high value uh, assets with uh, the the users of that that equipment and the, and the needs of the the off takers. So our pitch today is really focused on identifying potential what we what we consider core partners, and we've broken them out into two partner types. So what we're talking about is, when I say core partner is your a core partner can either either be an owner. And, and when I say owner, it means a partner that buys an, a set number of sun-based units and then allows us to rent them back when they're otherwise being stored. Um, this incur allows the partner to receive a discounted purchase price on that unit the or that you know, group of units, guaranteed maintenance on those sun-based trailers, and then also a, a rent out revenue share agreement. So what we're, we're trying to do is align the, the calendar of need for these units to, to subsidize the cost of delivering them to our core partners. So the other type of core partner that we've um, developed into our model is renters. And core partner renters commit to renting a, a set number of sun-based units for a set calendar, um, six months per year preset based on, on, on their calendar needs. And that affords them a discounted rental price, of course, guaranteed access to those units for that set um, calendar, those set calendar months. And um, for the socially impacted or so social impact minded fo folks, that rental revenue then can support local jobs to maintain and assemble additional sun-based units for, for uh, local and, and regional resilience. So we kind of backed into this by looking at, okay, how do we, when we're looking at the challenge of financing large capital assets for uh, you know, a diverse set of off takers, we've realized that we're not going to be able to scale a mobile solar uh, for Puerto Rico without bringing on a, these core partners. And I know I, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I just want to highlight that, that the benefits of putting solar battery systems on wheels are not only you know, response flexibility for the actual owner or renter, the, per, the group that is plugging in, um, you know, which allows them, you know, of course, to back up permanent infrastructure or rapidly set up remote resilience hubs. But there's also broader social benefits through the training and education that arises around how to deploy and plug in physically to, uh, you know, direct solar battery systems in the field, particularly when when folks would otherwise be in the dark. And and then, of course, longer term labor force development through the, the rental social enterprise around um, these units. So kind of looking at what we we see as potential ideal relationships, you know, we've we've just started these discussions. These are by no means, um, you know, set and set. But but we're, we really see a, an alignment with other response groups, folks that use gas and diesel generators a lot in the field. And then of course, construction or event companies that could potentially use these systems when they're not being deployed um, to, to disasters. Um, that'll get, a, that really helps us get the initial uh, fleet off the ground. And, and of course, we're, we're looking for grants and PRIs from, a, from groups that we believe share the mission of expanding direct access to solar energy and, and remote battery storage for folks uh, who need it most. The, just to kind of I'll lay out the structure on how we see this um, happening, we, so Footprint Project is a nonprofit. We, Footprint Project uh, owns Rent Solar, a general benefit corporation, and we take on new grants to set up Alquila Solar in Puerto Rico. That would be a, uh, that could take on outside investment as its own um, for-profit entity. Then that entity would contract local assembly and uh, operations and maintenance contractors 
who we've started discussions with um, uh, to then rent or sell those Sunbase units out to our core partners. Um, but we really want to highlight that we've kind of taken the approach that instead of going out to pursue financing or investment or grants um, to build solar trailers and then offer them for rental or sale to other partners, we really want to um, line up the users of these units, the core partner um, entities that we want to uh, work with before determining you know, how much financing or how much uh, um, uh, that kind of next step in developing, getting the capital stack put together because it really, uh, these units are only gonna be appropriate once we understand the energy needs of our core partners. So it's much more of a consultative pro approach and that um, in that regard, we're looking for, for not just, you know, cash and capital, but the network of partners that can make this type of program fly. Uh, we did model, you know, as part of precap, a a uh, set number of Sunbase units sold and and rented to core partners. We took thirty and thirty, though our our financial model allows us to kind of change those numbers, and we are more than willing to share and discuss that. We we don't claim to be the uh, end end all be all of mobile solar finance, though we have worked on it a lot, um, but we do, see, our model does show, show us being, uh, you know, reaching cash flow um, positive by year three for uh, Alquila Solar. Um, granted that is of course to totally dependent on the, the core partners we get, we can sign up. Uh, so the roadmap for all practical purposes looks very simple. We're, we're looking to bring on the core partner entities that we, that could really help us get out, get this off the ground, then pursue blended finance opportunities for, for the capital and OPEX expenditures needed to, to build and uh, just get the, the entity set up. Um, of course, setting up Alquila Solar in Puerto Rico and then confirming assembly and O&M partners to, to build and, and maintain the units based on um, which sizes our core partners need. Of course, the fun part is, is actually starting assembly. Um, I just want to highlight before we wrap up that this is not something new. We've been working on this since 2018, and we have, um, at least in 2020, <laughs> by far, had our biggest uh, disaster season yet. I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, and, and so we do feel capable of both assembling these units for specific core partner uh, energy needs and also deploying them or supporting the deployment in really challenging contexts. Um, overall, our goal, of course, is to facilitate energy emergency access and direct access to resilient clean energy. So plugs powered by a solar battery system when the grid is down. Um, and then, of course, to develop sustainable local jobs to to as we and to build the, the fleet. So if as our kind of final note, if uh, anyone is interested in working on this, we know we can't do it alone. Um, we hope that this can provide kind of an idea for how to develop local fleets of mobile solar uh, that can be delivered to communities uh, on the front lines of climate crisis. And uh, again, just thank you to everyone here for listening and thank you to the Fundacion Borincana and our, our advisors and cohort partners. Um, it's been it's been fun. Hey, thanks, Will. Uh, that was terrific, and uh, you know, I've, of course, I've seen this many times, but it just keeps getting better and better. So I figure by you know this time next year, you'll really have it down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so thanks again, uh, I think, for, for everyone. And uh, we actually do have, uh, have a question. Uh, I want to, uh, want to get to it. I think you can probably read it in the chat as well, Will, but uh, Jose Maeso uh, of Crowley, um, uh, shout out, hi, Jose. Uh, Will uh, has a good question, I think. Uh, I'll just read it out in case people aren't looking at chat. Uh, can you give examples of uh, who the renters would be? And... Uh, how often um, you know Sunbase could be used without damaging the units? Yeah, that's uh, it's totally dependent on the load. So, and of course, the size of the the system. Um, we our financial model that we were developing through precap contemplated 
you know, the renters signing up or the core partner renters signing up for six months per year um, of set rental. And that, you know, base, of course, it's a consultative process. We'd want to know what they're trying to power before we assign or, or match a sun-based system to those energy loads. Like we wouldn't want to send a light duty system to back up a fire station, it, you know, unless we, we knew that that fire station was only going to run a one chest freezer and radios. So that's part of the, the, the challenge in, in mobile solar is they're not, they're different from diesel generators in the sense that you can't just say, Hey, it's, you know, 10 kilowatts, just run it. Um, so we really want to know at least until it, that generator breaks, um, we, we would want to work with the potential renters to understand what they're wanting to power on site. But, um, we, we have designed these to be robust, you know, energy assets and they all are using you know warranted power, power electronics and really we focused on the design of the trailer frame so that they can hold up for for years at a time so um in that regard you know we think that the you know we put these things through the ringer ourselves um and and we're ready to for this reason we're ready to kind of start to offer this as a service to to other uh, like-minded organizations great uh, thanks, Will. Um, we think we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, I don't know if anybody has another question. I'll, I'll just mention that uh, Will is going to have the, a small group uh, discussion of this next week, uh, Wednesday the 9th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, which I guess you know translates noon Pacific time and 4 p.m. Uh, Atlantic time. The link to register for that meeting is in the Zoom chat right now. Uh, you may have to scroll up a little bit to find it because I jumped the gun and put it in a little early. Uh, but uh, but that's there. And I'll just check and see if we have another question. Uh, ah, que bueno. Um, and it's a good thing you speak, uh, you speak Spanish. So I'll just repeat it for everybody here rather than translate. <laughs> Uh, ¿Cómo manejan el tema de mantener los costo-beneficio para hacerlo rentable y accesible? And just to be clear, I, I um, want to respect people's time. Do, do we ha can I answer this stuff? Or yeah, can... you, we've, we've got time for this one question. Okay, and just so I understand it correctly, when we're um, talking about manejar, are we talking about the um, just the cost-benefit analysis to make them rentable or accessible? Yeah, um, it's the, uh, yeah, oh, God, yes, this is, this is not my best translating, and you've kind of reached the limits of my Spanish as well. Um, does somebody want to give uh, maybe, Will, a, a more clearer translation, um, Valentina or um, someone? Can you pipe in? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, this is Malu. I think um, the question is, uh, how do you how um how are you making it cost beneficial so that they're actually uh, you know are presented at a reasonable cost for rentals and making it accessible yeah um thank you malu i'll i'll answer it in english and then i'll try to <laughs> butcher it in spanish <laughs> um the our rental rates are comparable to like-sized diesel generators or gas generators so when we're looking at what the a light duty unit can power we're trying to match that rental rate to a similar size generator. Um, and for like a light duty unit, if it has two kilowatts of PV, we're sizing it similar to a two kilowatt generator, assuming that that battery bank can support a two kilowatt load for six to eight hours at night, which is the regular standard generator kind of rental agreement that you sign when you rent a gas generator. Um, entonces en español, Queremos como uh, alinar, alinar el, el costo de un generador uh, de, de uh, diesel con el costo de un, un sistema móvil solar que es parecido a este generador di, de diesel. Entonces, si es un como dos kilowatt generador, queremos, en, intentamos a uh, el costo del sistema móvil es parecido a este costo de, del, del generador de diesel. I tried. Hey, um, there's, there's also a question in here from Andy Darrell of, uh, of EDF. And, and since, uh, since I, I think it's an interesting question, um, 
it basically how much of the potential rental revenue is outside the disaster relief market. So, you know, that's, that's basically, you know, looking at your model and the assumptions that you've made uh, in your, in your figures, um, roughly how much do, do you expect to gain from the non-disaster market? That is a great question. We um, used to know before COVID, we now are relearning our outside rental market estimates. We were, you know, in 2019, we really piloted um, this, this idea using kind of taking the event industry. And then that, of course, evaporated from COVID. So now we're looking at more of the construction industry as a potential off taker until the rental industry comes back, which of course it will, but it's totally based on the vaccine rollout. Um, so I hope that provides some you know, idea there, but the, you know, the rental, the generator rental market is big enough for United Rentals, Agreco, um, Sunbelt generators. Um, there are a large, you know, that's a whole temporary power industry is a whole industry in itself. Um, we were initially focusing just because we don't have, you know, we're not VC backed or don't have the capital to build a hundred units at once and just kind of like see what happens. Um, we were focusing on high visibility events. Um, and now we're looking at least for the Puerto Rico, you know, as part of this project, looking at aligning with partner disaster response agencies who want access to resilient mobile solar power um, simultaneously, uh, then taking those units and then renting them to construction partners with, during the early recovery period. So that kind of looks like for hurricane season, we can offer it to a disaster response group that wants to keep the lights on in uh, when the grid uh, fails. And then during the recovery, we can take that same unit and move it to the reconstruction sites. Thanks, Will. And I think, uh, you know, to, to, to Andy, maybe you can sign up for the uh, small group session uh, next week and you can you can pull up and show. My, my recollection is when we were putting the numbers together, um, we kind of excluded the sort of event revenues, but it made uh, made some assumptions around the, the construction uh, rentals and percentages and things going forward. So, um, yeah, I mean, want to know more? Well, you know where to go. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Will. Uh, let's now uh, make our, our move to uh, uh, Pedro uh, and uh, Radio Grito and his project. I think uh, you guys are going to find this a really interesting uh, presentation because mm -hmm. he's in media and he knows how to do this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, wait, 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 as a Morikana, I learned so much. So, <laughs> so let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh, just let me know if you guys can see. Yeah, I, I, I can yes. see your, yes, there we go. Now it's full screen. Perfect. 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 So uh, welcome to Proyecto de Energía Resiliente de Radio Grito. Uh, we are a radio station uh, based in Lares, Puerto Rico, uh, in the central western part of the island. Uh, we're trying to do this resiliency project uh, for a 22 kilowatt photovoltaic solar system and, and a 54 kilowatt storage system for our project in Radio Grito. Radio Grito is a family owned radio station since 1986. My dad actually founded this radio station. We are in 1200 AM and 93.3 FM in the radio quadrants. Here, um, one, of the, one of the stories that my dad told me early on on the radio station is that Pedro, uh, our main purpose is to serve the community. Our main purpose is reality, not to be a radio station for music, not to be a radio station for entertainment, but be a radio station for serving, being a radio station for giving, helping people. That's our main purpose. And that's the, 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 the programming of the real station is based around that culture, is based around that idea, because we need to serve people in a way, in a way that people uh, deserve to be served. And we, we try to establish that for almost 35 years. And in, in Lares, we establish communities. You're gonna see, we establish uh, relationships for 34 years. And you're gonna see the power that Radio Grito has in the center western part of the island. Here, 
you can see the community of Lares. A very interesting, Lares is a mountain municipality located in the central western area of the island, like I said before. It's mostly comprised of 24,000 people. This number is expected to go down even more uh, because mostly over the age of 65 years is the people that are in Lares, Puerto Rico. The median household, household income in Lares is $14,000. This is based on the census of 2010. So the new census of 2020, we're estimating that that number is going down even more, approximately to $12,000 to $11,000 uh, median household income that will be. We have a very strong community base. Uh, we've been building a community for 34 years, not only with the municipalities, with the schools, with resiliency projects around the area, but also with, uh, with FEMA, USDA, SBA, they have pro they get invited uh, monthly every time to give the information. If they ask us to be in the radio station, like you see in the, in the pictures, they come, they give the information. We are always open to every kind of programming that is based on helping people. That is our main purpose of the radio station. Here, you can see uh, in Lares, this is the town of Lares, a shot, uh, aerial shot of the town. Here you can see the pinpoints where we are established and we have established community connections, not only with the municipality, but with schools, churches, uh, Casa Alianza Comunitaria de Lares. We've been talking with them. Uh, they, they're having given information of, of their project. Uh, churches, they have uh, a base community in every church that are connected with the radio station. Uh, in schools, kids, as you've seen, they go to the radio station for workshops, for communication workshops, and we hope with this project we can give uh, um, energy efficiency workshops and uh, agricultural workshops. That is very important for us because we are in an agricultural part of the island. And everybody talks about Maria. Come on, <laughs> that's 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 the truth. But no, not many people talk what they did in Maria. So Maria, we were uh, mostly six to seven months without any power. We only had a small generator that we all could only run for a couple of hours, and then we have to shut it off because if we run it for twenty-four hours, sixteen hours, it will break and we didn't have the, the money or there's no more generators around. So with that, we have thousands of people in the, in the community. We were the main source for the community because in Puerto Rico, there are more than 160 radio stations, only four. Can you hear that? Only four radio stations were all up and running after Maria. We were one of those four radio stations Thanks first to the Lord and second thanks to the and, uh, our army uh, for the, the antenna that we have. Uh, it's a very strong antenna and we were giving information, not only information and communication, we were assisting in storage for medicines, food, water, psychological. We have doctors coming to the rail station every day assisting hundreds of people making lines, not to only find out if their relatives were alive, but also to get a food, water, medicine. And that's what we were doing for six months, for six months. And we were doing it with, with only a gas generator going all day. So when we, when we turn off the generator, there was no communication. When we turn off the generators, we have to keep close our refrigerators because we didn't have energy to keep going. Imagine now with this project, with this resiliency project, if we can put this solar voltaic system and this battery system in our radio station, imagine the, the impact for the community that could be done. Also, we see we receive help from, from FEMA, we receive help from the USDA, from uh, Guardians and uh, Angels. They come from New York. They heard of us and they came from New York to Lares in Puerto Rico to give us help and help the community. So we established a great connection with them too. Here, you can see a video that uh, happened in uh, October of this year, October of 2020. 
Here we were giving, Radio Grito was giving 700 boxes of food, 700 boxes of food for the community of Lares. We were joined by the municipality, by the churches, and by the resiliency communities helping us giving this food out. So imagine this same scenario, almost a mile wide of people going to get food. Now imagine this in, in, the, in the disaster times. Imagine this af after Maria. Imagine this after a hurricane or earthquake. It will be double, triple the line. So we are organized. We have a, a great team working with us to organize this event. And this is the, the work that we do every single day. We've been doing this for 34 years. People tell us, hey, Pedro, uh, you, I don't know how you guys are doing this because the, 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 the big part of this is that the connections. And we established great connections in the municipality, great connections in the adjacent towns to help us give the, what, the, what the community needs. And here you can see a great example of it. So here you can have an idea what we offer right now. We offer clean water uh, with cisterns that we have. We offer solid phones and radio communication, of course. We offer a kitchen area with electric stove. We offer storage area that we use for medical equipment and food supply. And we have a, a emergency protocol for, for uh, and established for situations just like that. And who have a security, security system that is very secure for our community and our employees. So the phase one of this project of Radio Grito is a solar photovoltaic system and storage system. It's a 20 kilowatt uh, solar system, a 54 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hour storage system. And the cost of this project is $103,500. This, um, this is uh, for the information that we're getting because 72, we, we have a daily consumption of 72 kilowatt hour in energy. So with that consumption and the very important part with the battery storage system, we can keep going, giving for the community, helping the community. That's the main idea. So the phase two of the project probably is gonna be looking like this. This is a very strong slide right here, people. You can see here, the photovoltaic uh, project that we were working on. And also we are planning on adding on the phase two of the project, a, a agricultural hub. We're planning on adding a, a, um, some washing machines. It's very important. And we're planning adding more storage area so people can have uh, medicines and food stored in that area. And also this storage hub, and, and this agricultural hub and this storage area and this uh, solar system will also work for giving workshops to the children in the, in the schools because the schools ask us where to give these workshops because they don't have it anywhere in, in Lattice or the uh, municipalities around. So they can, the children can come to the radio station, not only have a communications workshop, but also solar energy, agricultural, the things that we need as Puerto Ricans so we can go further in life and, and, and raise Puerto Rico to a better level, to a higher level, higher level. Um, here you can see that with, the, with this solar system, we will be reducing the cost of our, our bill, right? Because it, that will be $6,545 uh, that will be reducing. That will translate to to 20 metric tons of carbon dioxide, 20 metric tons of carbon dioxide out of Lares, Puerto Rico. That, that would be amazing. And of course, the total savings around the generator, because we only have a gas generator, generator and in Lares, Puerto Rico, the generator, we turn it basically every two days, we have to turn it on because uh, the, the energy in Lares is very unstable. So because it is unstable, we have, been, we have to, to spend money in, maintain, in maintenance and in gas. So that's, not very, that's very, uh, a lot of money that we have to, to invest so we can keep giving the information and helping people. So with this sort of project, this will be a great add-on for this. So uh, Radio Grito Resiliency Project is looking for financial partners to help support the vision. This vision, 
that you I, I already showed you that is a vision to help the community. That's our base, our cultural, our our entire existence of Radio Grito is to help the community. Grants to reduce cost and burden we were looking for and lenders to finance and balance of the project. That is very important to us. So Proyecto de Energía Resiliente de Radio Grito. My name is Pedro Hernández Bello. We have a group session uh, uh, on December 8th, 2020 at 9 a.m. If you want more information of this project and how we're going to be going throughout the phase two, we can meet up there. I will greatly appreciate it and I will answer all your questions and, and the matter can be. Also, I want to thank uh, Fundación Borincana. We made them part of our programming with Valentina Garramuño, who is doing an excellent job and giving the people information that they need. People in Lattes has called us and said, we didn't know all that information that Fundación Borincana is giving. We didn't know what was happening in the energy in the energy sector. And now with this program, people are getting educated. People are getting informed. Of what we of what is Fundación Borincana and what are the possibilities out there? Without Fundación Borincana, we only think about Radio Grito as a real station. Now, with Fundación Borincana, we think about Radio Grito as a resiliency project, a resiliency center who help people every day. Thank you very much. God bless you all, and I hope for the question I can ask them in the meantime. Thank you. That was terrific, Pedro. And, and again, you know, getting getting better and better uh, every time. Uh, I I put the uh, the link, the registration link for your uh, small group session uh, that you mentioned at the end. It's in the chat now. Appreciate uh, it. And again, everyone who registered will uh, will get a, a copy and the ability to register and and, uh, and speak to you uh, more about your 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 project and your goals. Awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, I. Don't see any any additional questions for you here, so I think you'd probably answered everybody's questions. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll think of more when they join you in your uh, your private group session. So our uh, our last uh, group uh, up today uh, before we uh, we move into uh, kind of closing uh, comments uh, is the uh, Green Gas Puerto Rico uh, project and uh, Luis Viana. Luis, do you want to take yourself off of uh, mute and Show us. Uh, <laughs> I see, I see Vasant is on. Um, there's Lewis. Hey, Lewis, I just unmuted you, so. Maybe you can you can turn on your your video. Machine financial culture by twenty twenty two. Completing condition. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Pisanth. Maybe we can. Um, sorry. Sounds like he he took a phone call in there. Uh, okay. Let me just, uh, hmm. uh, Vasant, is there a way that you can, uh, you can you'd tap uh, Lewis and get him off the phone? Yes, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I'd love to say I've never done that, but that would be a bold faced lie. <laughs> yeah, in any event. Um, you know, maybe this is a good point to uh, to, to intersect. Um, we've got a, we've got a couple of events coming up. Um, you know, as Lewis I think, gets himself ready, uh, that we want to make you aware of. And uh, one of them, and you know, I'll put the slides up after the presentation to close. But we'll we'll get a head start on it. Uh, one is our episode four of Buenos Dias con Energia uh, is going to be up online in uh, I think. Sorry, Monday. I think twelve seven Monday, uh, and it's uh, featuring none other than our own Mario Blasquez uh, talking about um, you know the resiliencia energetica comunitaria. Uh, that's a, a great episode that it, 
opportunity to, uh, to, to listen to it already. Uh, so I think you'll find it uh, very uh, informative and, um, and fun. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll mention, and I do want to come in and, and talk uh, talk more about it specifically, is uh, we're actually going to be hosting uh, a webinar uh, on the 15th uh, entitled uh, Driving Energy, Puerto Rico's Energy Transformation in 2021. Um, I'll give you kind of more details on that later, um, but I think is... I don't know. Lewis, are you, uh, are you ready to come back? There you are. Yes. Yes. I'm here. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I, as I said to, the, to, to everyone here, it's, it's, it's not like I've never been caught on a phone call <laughs> when I was yeah. on something else. So, uh, fantastic. So we're looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. Um, this is Lewis Viana. Uh, I'll let you go from here. You can share your screen whenever you're ready and, uh, okay. and take over. Okay. Let me share my screen. All right, I'll take myself off. Can you see the screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, excellent. So, um, hi, my name is Luis Arviana. Um, I have 25 years of experience in working with bioengineering and together with um, one of our founders, Dr. Vassan, whom is a researcher scholar and professor at the University of Florida School of Engineering are the sponsors and developers of Green Gas Puerto Rico. Um, I should say that we are extremely excited. And the reason for this excitement is because we are at the verge of creating a bioeconomy industry in Puerto Rico. Uh, Green Gas Puerto Rico is a company seeking to develop the first commercial biodigester unit and producer of renewable natural gas in Puerto Rico. We are in the early stages of development and are looking to expand our development team with experienced development partners and raise development capital. Puerto Rico has a transitioning infrastructure and an economy that has an increasing appetite for natural gas. This will be true even if we transition from fossil fuel generation to distributed renewable generation. As the graph to the left depicts, <clears throat> we can see increase, the increase of impacted uh, liquid natural gas from 2000 to 2019, it has increased 556% and is growing. Puerto Rico has a long-term problem handling waste it produces due to chronic underinvestment and regulatory and environmental factors. It is rapidly running out of places to dispose of its waste. The graph to the right shows you a clear image of how Puerto Rico is running out of places to dispose of its waste. As a fact, by 2025, it is predicted that there will only be 10 landfills. Our project is targeting to be ready by 2023, positioning ourselves in order to take advantage of this business opportunity. So what is the solution? We will treat 214 tons per day or 15% of the organic waste by constructing the, uh, and operating the first commercial anaerobic digester while producing renewable natural gas at an investment of $40 million. By doing so, we will be taking the first step in building a bio-based economy that is replicable to develop other bio-based products, for example, CO2, food grade, um, methanol, fertilizers, among other. The natural gas import is going up and we pretend to offset import with the local production through the bioeconomy industry. 
Why are the conditions so favorable to develop this industry? Number one, the demand for natural gas and green products produced locally for an element of resiliency for the market in Puerto Rico means that we will have a large demand for our product at a potential premium. Number two, because Puerto Rico has a big problem with waste disposal. It means that we are in a great position to benefit of grants from the government of Puerto Rico and EPA representing potential non-dilutive development capital. Scarcity of landfill space means that tipping fees will remain high, which helps underwrite our future project economics. What is the value stream that we can see here? By constructing the anaerobic digester, we will convert the organic waste to renewable natural gas. As you can see to your right, there is a huge number of potential off-taker partners for the RNG or renewable natural gas that will be produced. It is important to note here that this is entirely proven technology in operation everywhere around the world, but not in Puerto Rico. This project, we are not taking any risks. This technology is, is highly proven. We are an expert in dealing with this type of business. Myself, I am a PhD candidate at Columbia University, where I am precisely at this time and moment dealing with new technologies on how to manipulate the microorganisms that are responsible for uh, producing higher yield. This technology is not going to be taken into consideration in our new project, but just wanted to let you know the high level of expertise that we have in dealing with anaerobic digesters. The total amount of organic waste available in Puerto Rico, just to give you an idea, is 372,300 tons per year. So this represents a potential renewable natural gas production of 17.7 .7 million gallons per year. And, and I want to st um, stress out that this does not take into consideration other feedstocks that we have available in Puerto Rico, like for example, waste manures or slush wastewater. Now, in terms of the uh, main revenue stream, stream, this project will have several sources of revenue, the most significant of which are renewable natural gas sales and tipping fees. The tipping fees are what people pay to dispose of their waste, usually in a landfill. These averages about 19, 28 tons uh, dollars per ton on solid waste in Puerto Rico, which is well below the national average of $51 per ton. So in an environment of a shrinking landfill space, cost for disposal space stands to increase potentially drastically. We will also produce sellable fertilizers and probably fruit grade CO2, but this product volumes and revenue streams are generally considerably smaller than the gas that we're going to produce and the tipping fee. This is an industry in demand and is solving two problems while adding resiliency. We recognize in this um, revenue stream, tax credit as a revenue stream, but we are not quantifying it at this precise time. So our first project economics, you can see here in this graph, uh, we pretend to construct a anaerobic digester with a capacity of treating 214 tons per day, which represents 15% of the um, total organic waste in Puerto Rico. The uh, production of renewable natural gas is between 2.7 million gallons per year. And the production cost is 0.74 gallons, dollars per gallon. I mean, cents per gallon, excuse me. And the average sales is price in Puerto Rico is $2 per gallon. The tipping fees, like I mentioned before, is more or less on an average basis of $25 per ton. And at an investment of $40 million, 
um, the uh, 6.7 renewal year only takes into account renewable natural gas and the tipping fees. So this is our first plant. We fully expect and intend to add additional plants to take advantage of the feedstock in the market and increase our renewable natural gas production. Um, average life of a anaerobic facility is greater than 50 years with re relatively low cost for major maintenance expenditures. We are looking at a headline payback period of seven to eight years. And utility scale solar and gas generation, for example, plants have a similar payback period, but have a maximum life of around 30 years. This is a good metric of how valuable this infrastructure of constructing an anaerobic digester is for our sponsors and for Puerto Rico. So in terms of moving forward and developing our program, right now, we are in the early development, working on the market characterization plant, site identification, and building relationship with potential feedstocks, off takers, and EPCs. We anticipate selecting our site for the first project in the middle of next year, June. 2021, completing our main contracts in October of 2021, um, completing um, fee stock contracts, off takers agreement, etc. Reaching financial closure early 2022, completing condition pr precedence and beginning construction in second quarter of April 2022. And after construction period of 18 months, reaching commercial operation date on the first, fourth quarter, excuse me, of October of, of 2023. This is the uh, sponsor team. Um, Dr. Vasan Balazo Baramian is an expert in bioremediation, um, biotreatment, isolation of microbes, and has 10 years of experience in dealing with environmental. Um, projects and is currently a researcher at the University of Florida and also a professor of the uh, School of Engineering. Myself, I have 25 years of experience dealing with operating, constructing, designing, refurbishment of anaerobic digesters and some of the work projects that we have worked with is refurbishing, designing the, the anaerobic digester of Bacardi in Catania, Puerto Rico. We have also worked with the anaerobic digesters in Holson Bakery, among other plants. I am also a expert witness in anaerobic digesters and anaerobic process. I have testified at federal and state courts. And like I mentioned previously, I am a PhD candidate at the Columbia University in New York, where I am focusing my dissertation in developing new technology for anaerobic digesters and increasing biogas here. So um, in terms of highlighting this, the project, um, the first thing that I want to mention is the how strongly favorable this market condition is. Puerto Rico has two big problems that create incredibly favorable conditions for the development and execution of this business model. It's profitable and sustainable infrastructure asset with incredible long, productive and profitable life. Experience team, uh, like I just mentioned, we have a high accomplished core development team with um, extensive experience in dealing with this type of anaerobic digesters um, from the beginning to the end, um, operating, maintaining, constructing and designing. Um, it's a replicable project model. The first project can be replicated several more times in Puerto Rico, um, local energy resources. We will create a local source of storable energy, adding resiliency to the island during disaster condition. And lastly, but not less important, is a low technology risk. There is a low to no technology risk related to biodigester plant design, construction, and operation. It's a proven technology. 
So we have, like I said, extensive experience in dealing with this type of technology. We are at the stage of development and looking to expand our team to complement our team strength, partner with strong development-minded group and raise development capital. We would recommend conversation with interested parties. Um, lastly, uh, we'd like to invite you to a private and more detailed discussion on how you can become part of the development team and the development capital and on October, December 9th at 10 a.m. We have scheduled a, a meeting with whomever is interested. Um, I understand that Thomas and Fundación Borincana will be including our link to all the registrants. I would um, like to thank everyone for their time for reviewing Green Gas Puerto Rico and its potential. And I would like to thank the pre-crap program, the mentors, Jorge Rodriguez, John Rivas, and all fellow cohort members that contribute to our experience and learning process. And lastly, but not less important, I would like to acknowledge Gonzalo which has assisted us in organizing the graphics and the presentation, and also as well, um, creating this wonderful logo. So having said that, um, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Lewis, thanks. That was, uh, that was terrific. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's gratifying to, to see, uh, you know, this, this develop uh, over the course of, of this program and, and, of course, over the course of the last couple of days. Um, so, a terrific job. Uh, there's a, there's a, actually a few questions here. I don't know if we have time to, to do all of them, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe just a handful. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just ask you whether... Um, the registration link, uh, whether Vasant has it, maybe you could put it into the chat. Uh, if you don't have it yet, uh, you can send it to us. We'll include it in, in the uh, communication, the email that we send all of the registrants to make sure they have it. Uh, no, you're planning on it. doing we, this we Wednesday. Have it. You have it. Yeah, we why have it. Why don't you put that into the chat and then people can pick it up that, there uh, now and then you can send it to us and we'll include it in the mailing. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> wow, some good questions here. Actually, uh, you've you've provoked a lot of uh, a lot of thought. Um, let me. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I guess there's a there's a question more on the market. I think from from Jose. Jose, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest maybe you sign up for the the private chat. That's a really you know, specific uh, question. Um, but uh, you know, let's let's go from there in terms of wholesale, retail, kind of relative value. Um, the, uh, let's see, well, here, here's a good one. I know that you, that you have, a uh, thing. how does green gas, uh, Puerto Rico face the regulatory challenge in Puerto Rico? It, well, this, that's a, a very interesting question, but, um, well, first of all, the project by itself, in order to be developed, you need to comply with several, um, env environmental regulations. Um, environmental permits. You have, for example, to deal with the Title V, which is the Clean Air Act permit. You also need to deal with the Clean Water Act, which is the water discharge permit, and also with the solid, special solid waste permit. So there is regulation already in place. This is nothing new. Um, we know the regulations, we know the permitting process, we know what has to be done in order to start the operation. Um, there, like I mentioned, there is other anaerobic digesters in Puerto Rico, for example, Bacardi. So this is not a new process and it's already regulated and the procedures and process in place are already established. So you just have to know how to tap into the uh, regulatory process in order to submit all the required applications that are needed in order to start the operation. I hope that answers the question. That's great. I think let's, let's do, uh, let's do one more, uh, maybe. Uh, David, I think put one up 
uh, that someone asked him, uh, are there presently similar projects in the US or other countries that validate your development model? Yes, yes, yes. There's in California, for example, there's a lot of anaerobic digesters um, that can, um, uh, how can I say, validate, so to speak, the business model that we are going to develop. Um, in Puerto Rico, obviously, is going to be the first one. But in other parts of the mainland, there is anaerobic digesters already in construction and in operation. Terrific. All right, so uh, we may get the link in the chat. Uh, if not, we'll make sure to uh, provide the, the registration link for the small group session that uh, Lewis and, and Basant are going to hold next week. Uh, I wanna say it's Wednesday at 10 a.m. Atlantic, I think if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but uh, yeah, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll look out for that. So in, in just uh, looking to, to, I guess, you know, hit the, hit the final here, um, let me, uh, sorry, used to be better at this. Let me share my screen again. Is that the right one? Yeah, that looks right. Okay, can everybody see, it should say upcoming events? Yes. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> so we got that right. So uh, I mentioned this before uh, in, the, in the gap before uh, Lewis uh, started, uh, but uh, Buenos Dias con Energia, and then we have the energy transformation in 2021 uh, event. Um, here's the banner. Uh, these, uh, our last event of 2020, uh, it's basically a look forward to 2021 and a year that, uh, we all, I firmly believe is going to be a watershed in the transformation of energy in Puerto Rico. Uh, we have highlights, uh, highlights of this. Basically, I'm going to be sitting down, uh, and having a conversation, a fireside chat with Mario Hurtado of Luma. And we're going to cover a range of important topics. And then there's going to be a panel discussion uh, moderated by Gail Nolan from Invest Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's actually going to include uh, a couple of our friends from the program here, uh, among others. And I think, I actually think everyone who's going to be speaking uh, within the change makers is actually uh, on this call, but not everyone is from the program. Uh, this is actually one of the first, if not the first time, a senior figure from Luma is going to be discussing the transformation of energy publicly. So I don't think you want to miss it. So tickets are actually on sale now. Uh, yes, this is a paid event, but it's a bargain at only $30. Um, we got to find a way to pay the, the, uh, the light bill somehow. Uh, the link for that will be distributed, but I think uh, David or someone is probably putting a link in the chat as we speak. Um, nonprofit and government are still free, uh, so don't sweat it. Uh, overall space is uh, absolutely limited, so you know the sooner you uh, you sign up, uh, obviously the better. Uh, I think it's going to be a very very entertaining uh, discussion. So uh, last and uh, you know kind of a, a, a retread maybe of a few things that we said before. So transformation requires funding. Uh, We've been hit as many others with the pandemic and the earthquakes, and we haven't been able to really start our fundraising. We're still you know, somewhat of a, a young nonprofit, uh, and we're just beginning to build our donor base. Uh, we are very, very interested in uh, talking to uh, corporates and others about sponsorship relationships to help us support the programs and the things that we do, uh, and you know, give them a, uh, the exposure and uh, participation that I think that they need and deserve. And we're also beginning to align ourselves with uh, the larger grant making organizations and uh, beginning to uh, discuss how we can work together to, to raise more capital to you know, sustain the operations of the nonprofit. Uh, again, we said we had a target in the drive and the, the link for, for donations are, you know, of course, in the, uh, in the chat and probably being put back in there again. Uh, a couple of other things to, to think about. I think we secured the, the largest grant um, ever in the history of Puerto Rico uh, through the RDBG uh, program from the USDA in order to fund this program this year. Uh, we are anticipating 
that we're going to get uh, CDBG DR funding to extend this program and to initiate our uh, solar IT workforce and market development program. But of course, if you've been paying attention, it's uh, hard to miss the fact that the delays that we've all seen in award uh, means that we're probably gonna have a gap in a support in early 2021, which actually just makes the need more acute. Uh, the other thing to note is that since we're largely funded some of these programs through government grants, these have to be supported by cost share. Uh, and perhaps even more important, they're set up as being reimbursable and reimbursement is painfully slow. Uh, we certainly have experienced that, uh, but we've also been notified that uh, for reimbursements under CDBG, uh, it would be wise to expect three to six months of delay in Puerto Rico, making our working capital requirements absurdly large. Uh, just to put that in context, if you've got a half a million dollar grant, that means you've got to have $250,000 of dry capital just lying around, right? How many, <laughs> how many nonprofits, let alone active businesses, actually have that going? So we need to, we need to raise more money and we need to work on this. Uh, PRI programs uh, potentially could answer that, and we're certainly open to discussing that as well. I think the other thing is that moreover, program-related uh, grants don't offer the you know, amounts in the way of funding to cover general operating expenses. So the bottom line is we need to raise mission capital to, to carry out our work more effectively. Um, so again, I hope that everyone will consider the impact and value that we're bringing to, to Puerto Rico and uh, support us with a financial contribution. Um, I'll say again, uh, don't give till it hurts. Uh, just until you feel good about it. Uh, we'd also like your support with uh, non-financial, uh, as we mentioned before, joining our Transformation Drive team, liking and following us on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And if uh, if I've managed this uh, this magic right, uh, these should, links should be appearing uh, in the chat uh, at the moment as well. So I think there's nothing left for me to do, but to thank you all for spending your time, to thank the, the cohort members uh, for their diligence, incredibly hard work, their terrific uh, presentations. And I uh, encourage and exhort uh, everyone here to, to spread the word and uh, follow up, uh, register for the uh, private group sessions to get more of your questions answered. Um, with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to the end and uh, thank everyone again. Uh, we look forward to working with you guys uh, throughout next year, and uh, hopefully we'll see many of you in the uh, driving uh, Puerto Rico's energy transformation in 2021 event coming up on the 15th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Well done, Tom. Thanks a lot.